My previous video on an Epifan product was this AVIO HD video grabber from Epifan Video. And they apparently liked it so much they not only featured my review on their website, but they also sent me their big Epifan Pearl multi live streaming, multi viewing, mixing machine for review. And this has been a blast to check out. The Epifan Pearl is your one stop shop for video live streaming, mixing, input switching, production, and video recording all in one handy box. It handles all of those things up to 1080p 60 frames per, se per second or even upscaled to 4K. The Pearl can be quite portable with the custom hard shell carrying case that comes shipped with the product or you can order a 2U rack mount shelf to put it in your rack mounted studio setup. Taking a physical tour of this beautiful machine, you start out on the front with the lovely touchscreen for the multi-viewing and live switching between your input sources, as well as a 3.5mm jack for your audio monitoring, a power indicator LED, and the Epifan Video and Pearl logo. The back features 19 volt DC power input, a power button, two display ports, which are currently in experimental functionality, but in upcoming automatic firmware updates, they will have a lot more features for video output, two USB ports for bringing in assets and copying your footage off of the internal hard drive, a gigabit NIC, and then two streams of video and audio inputs. Both sets of inputs features an SDI port, a VGA port, an HDMI port, and then two quarter inch analog audio inputs, which can be balanced or unbalanced. The top of the device is a nice gray or silver metal-y finish. The sides of the device provide ventilation for the massive computer that's inside. And the bottom of the device features four rubber feet which keep it very firmly in place despite the heft that the device has. The Pearl can capture or stream up to four different video inputs via the VGA inputs, HDMI inputs, or the SDI. The VGA being compatible with up with DVI conversion as well, so with the HDMI technically, and the SDI supports 3G SDI, HD SDI, or SDSDI. SDSDI. Yeah. Audio can be captured via the SDI, HDMI, or analog connectivity as well. With support for live audio video mixing via the web UI or the touchscreen interface, this thing can handle just about anything. It can literally record just about anything. Cameras desktops, game consoles, I was recording my PS4 and my camcorder at the same time, it can handle a lot. It can handle up to four video streams at 1080p 30 frames per second. If you knock it down to three video streams, it can handle two at 1080p 60 frames per second and one at 1080p 30. If you handle two, you can obviously do 1080p 60 frames per second. Or if you down it to one or two, you can also upscale to 4K at lower frame rates. I was able to record both a copy of my PS4 a copy of my camcorder, and then even a copy of my PS4 screen with my camcorder overlaid over top at 1080p 60 frames per second in very high quality with no problem with this device. And same thing with live streaming. I was able to live stream that while recording. No input lag, no frame drops, nothing that I noticed. The Pearl can automatically take all of your audio and video inputs and create some automatic presets for the quality and settings that it records or streams at. And then you can just use the touch screen to switch between your inputs and just go on the fly. Or you can log into the web UI and set up your own custom presets, custom recording profiles. Like I said, I recorded not only just raw streams of my inputs, but I even recorded inputs mixed and in picture in picture on top of each other and things like that. It was pretty cool. And it can handle picture in picture and picture by picture, which is very nice to see. You can, of course, bring in your own assets in terms of overlays and as long as they're PNGs and on screen graphics and things like that as well to really create a nice studio broadcast setup. Streaming to local browsers, media players, and smart TVs is supported as well as external RTMP and RTSP CDNs, such as YouTube, Twitch, Hitbox, and even educational platforms like Blackboard, which is pretty impressive. The Pearl features hardware accelerated encoding for H.264, but MPEG-4 and MJPEG encoding formats are also supported. Audio can be recorded at up to 320 kilobit per second at PCM or AAC, or even MP3 audio formats. An internal one terabyte hard drive is utilized to record as high quality as possible of your local recordings of your streaming broadcast. You can do either just a copy of your live stream or you can record a totally high quality copy that differs from the copy that you're live streaming as well, which is very convenient and still difficult to pull off in current just normal broadcasting software such as Wirecast, XSplit, or OBS. OBS multi-platform and Wirecast I know for sure have options for this, 
but depending on your computer, you may not actually be able to handle this. And this is a lot of problem with indie sports broadcasters that I've worked with is their computers can't actually handle recording and streaming to two different formats. And so having a box like this really pulls off the load um, on your computer of doing something like that. And it handles it without a problem. Local recordings can be saved to MOV, AVI, or MPEG-TS file containers. I did run into an issue where the AVI container, be it with multiple tracks or single tracks, would not open in either Sony Vegas Pro nor my Adobe Suite at all. It converted fine in YouTube. YouTube converted it without even hesitating on the processing, which rarely happens and it even worked fine in like VLC player and things like that. However, Premiere and Vegas would not open it. MOV files opened fine. I, they were a little slow in the playback, so I ended up transcoding them before I actually used them to edit, but they opened fine and the MPEG TS opened and worked fine as well. But the AVI for whatever reason did not open for me in Adobe. This may be a codec specific issue that probably shouldn't affect most people. Uh, they're, we're working on that, but it's probably an issue on my end, but I wanted to mention it nonetheless. With these containers, you can actually set to record multiple audio video tracks to the same file if you wish. Then you can use their web user interface to extract those two separate files, which I find to be pretty convenient. Something else that does this is a program like DXTory or other high level encoders as you can actually record multiple format or multiple streams and tracks to one file. This can be convenient, but it can also cause a hassle. Uh, it, re it handles both recording to separate files and recording to the same file at the same time just fine. So pick and choose whichever you want to do. You can even set up automatic transfers of your local recordings to either a USB drive hooked up to the USB ports. Keep in mind though, it is a USB 2.0 port or two USB 2.0 ports on the back of that, not USB 3. Or you can transfer to a network hard drive, which goes very quickly as long as you have a gigabit network set up, which I was very impressed for like a two gigabyte file. It only took me a couple seconds to download off of the device, which is very nice to see. On a side note, this entire machine is powered by an Intel Nook. Those tiny little computers are super flexible. I've seen videos on them and advertises for them and things like that, but I've never seen a practical application of it where I at least knew that a Nook was in there. And when you boot on this device, it shows the Intel Nook splash logo. And so it's cool to see one of these in actual use. It's also worth mentioning that all of Epifan Video's products are created in completely produced and manufactured in Canada, which is nice to see. It's not made in the USA, but it's made in our northbound friends and not made in China. So thumbs up for me on that. To show some of the capabilities, I'm gonna feature some of the video recordings that I did and test streams that I did here as the B-roll and you've probably already seen some of it already, but I do wanna reiterate, I did bring up a couple different streams. I recorded my PlayStation 4 at 1080p 60 frames per second. I recorded my 60 frames per second camcorder by HDMI out at 60p at 60 frames per second. And then I did a mashup where I had the PS4 with the camcorder overlaid on top of it in picture in picture mode at 1080p 60 frames per second with the automatic bitrate encoding options enabled. It looks really, really great. No quality loss whatsoever. The audio sounds really great and it definitely holds up compared to most just standard capture cards, which is really good to see because you obviously don't want to lose quality in getting this machine. And instead of having to have a machine where you have to hook up your own capture cards and things like that, it's all bundled here and it works great. The PS4 was connected by HDMI and the camcorder was hooked up by a mini HDMI to an HDMI cable and both through the HDMI inputs with audio transporting over the HDMI signal. Everything captured great. The automatic configuration picked it up perfectly and worked out great. It automatically said, hey, 1080p 60 frames per second. Automatic quality, 1080p 60 frames per second, automatic quality. I was just impressed. Typically with stuff, especially with a camcorder for some reason, stuff often doesn't want to get the right profiles automatically when it comes to capture cards and dongles. But with this, it picked it up immediately. I didn't have to change any sections or settings. All I had to do was plug in the HDMI cable and the video preview popped up, popped up on the touch screen and I was able to switch between them and preview them and things like that. So, so it worked out really well. The web UI is fairly easy to navigate, but at the same time, if you're trying to find specific settings, it's easy to get lost or screw up. For example, in your automatic recording settings, you have a record button for those various inputs, but you can also set up custom recorders, which record independently of the sources. So you can set up custom recorders to do like I did, where you have input A and input B or input A on top of input B and have those as custom recorders. But then you can also be recording or streaming from the actual source itself. And so with me jumping in without actually taking a look at the user's guide on their website, I accidentally ended up live streaming every time I tried to record. And so I got a bunch of tweets saying, hey, why aren't you talking in your live stream? 
because I never intended to live stream, but I had that checkbox checked in a menu that I lost somewhere. And I, I personally would prefer to see more of the multi-viewer production software setup like on the TriCasters and vMix software and things like that um, versus just kind of like a router's admin menu, which is this kind of looks like. But it still works fairly well and the user's guide will definitely help you out. Hindsight's definitely 2020. I should have looked at that first. But that's not how I do things. I jump in without reading the manual. Unless it comes to building a bookshelf like this because I wouldn't have got it done without the manual. The mini display port ports on the back of the device are currently not all that useful. They're an experimental feature which new beta features will be coming out in a firmware update very soon. But at the moment all it does is output a sideways like 360p copy of the touchscreen's video to it. So I had it running from display or mini display port to HDMI to my capture card to try to test this and literally it was just a sideways low resolution because the screen's low resolution uh, copy of the touchscreen's video. So it's not really very useful and it's not even useful for like a bigger preview because it's the same size and it's sideways. But again, I'm told these will be updated very soon and will continue to be added for more experimental usage. The ability to monitor your live stream's audio via the 3.5 millimeter jack on the front is very nice, but I would have kind of liked to see some sort of volume control for it as well. Uh, using my AKG K7XX headset to monitor my output, it never got too loud despite the fact that those cans can get bleedingly loud. It, it never got too loud to hurt my ears even with volume, you know, even with games I sound very loud and my camcorder sound very loud and things like that. But for safety or even for doing at live events where it's loud in the background and you have no way to compensate for that, some sort of volume control of your preview audio would be kind of nice. The touchscreen is small, but it's very useful for live switching between your inputs. You can preview both in or your multiple inputs side by side and in a grid and things like that and switch between them. Or you can preview one at a time, tell it whether you're recording, which scene you're recording, things like that. And it even has a volume preview when your volume input is going so you can see how loud your audio is which is pretty cool. You can even use the web UI to build a bunch of different scenes and layouts and things like that and then use the touchscreen to switch between them. So you can build that up ahead of time using the web UI and then like say you're on set or on show or on in the field or wherever you're using this, you can just use the touchscreen to switch between them and do everything pretty much automatically and just with the touchscreen, which is pretty cool. Nothing's more annoying than being at a live event and having to go through all the menus of a web UI to change settings to get it right when, or change inputs and skip the input and go to black screen then back to the right input and things like that, when you can just touch it on the touch screen. The device gets decently warm hitting about 53 Celsius when recording and live streaming. And that's not bad though. Like it never gets hot to the touch. It never kicks out a lot of heat in my room that's frankly cooler than my computer runs and my PlayStation 4 probably runs, and it's quieter than both as well. The fans never kicked on very high. They did pick up a little bit once it was recording both inputs at once and doing craziness, but it never got that loud, which really surprises me because most of this pro-level broadcast equipment that I've used, granted I haven't used a whole heck of a lot, but I do use what I can, it gets extremely loud. For example, I tested out a year or so ago the Blackmagic ATEM 4K switcher and as soon as you plug power into that thing, the fans were on full spin, whoosh, just loud as hell. And this never got quite there. That's very cool. This means you can integrate it both in a on-the-go setup or in a home studio without it causing too much of its own noise. I'd love to integrate it into my home setup Epifan video, wink wink. Overall, the Epifan Pearl is one lean, mean, green, well, gray, Streaming, broadcasting, video recording, live switching, multi-mixing machine. The only thing I can think of to compare it to off the top of my head is the TriCaster 40, which just came out and is about the same price point from TriCaster. TriCaster being one of the bigger, most more well-known names for these types of broadcasting machines in the like indie sports realm. I, I interned it for a couple years with Live Sportscaster, which does a lot of high school sports broadcasting and stuff like that locally and is a streaming site for it. And so we've worked with some of that stuff and things, and that's where I tested out the ATM switcher from. That's where I got my mixer from, things like that. And the, the advantages and disadvantages between the two are kind of strange. For example, the TriCaster has the full video production suite in terms of a user interface that I much more prefer, like I mentioned before. 
However, technically wise, while it can do four inputs and live stream and record to two different places, it only goes up to 720p when live streaming. Whereas this can do full 1080p 60, that can only do 720p. So it's like if you want more quality and capability, go with the Epifan Pearl. If you want better, like more intuitive, in theory intuitive software, go with the TriCaster if you're used to that kind of production setup. So it's like, it's more like the TriCaster is more to be the only device you need for that sort of thing on top of a camera, uh, but sacrifice quality, whereas the Pearl is something you might integrate into a multi-device setup, but keep a lot higher quality, which is what I prefer, of course. For its price point, from what I've seen, the Epifan Pearl certainly has some bang for the buck. It's quite flexible and can stream and record video to your heart's content. There's a lot more to this product than I could ever possibly cover in one video, and given that this is one of the few Pearl level products that I've gotten to review, though I do love reviewing them, I don't have a whole lot of experience to shove it all into one video. However, I did my best to give an overall review and impression of the product nonetheless, as I think it's something that would be great for broadcasters and people wanting to record home studio videos. I'd love to dive deeper and do more of an educational series on some of the features and setting up tutorials and things like that for the Epifan Pearl. However, unfortunately, this is a loaner unit, so I do have to send it back. So if we want to get that kind of con content, we really need to see a resounding response to Epifan video telling them, give Epos another one to do tutorials on for a little bit or something. So comment below if you want to see that. Thanks so much for watching my review of the Epifan Pearl broadcasting, live switching, mixing, mastering, <laughs> streaming, and video production box. This thing is a boss. Be sure to like the video if you liked it, dislike if you didn't like it, and I will cry myself to sleep at night. Subscribe to the channel for more awesome tech videos just like this one. Uh, check out links in the description below to the Epifan Pearl itself, some more information you can read about it on their website. My AVIOHD video being featured on their website as well, and our link to our Patreon campaign where you can contribute to the channel my monthly contribution and get early access to our videos. Uh, way before they come out and things like that. So thank you so much for watching. Be sure to comment, like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.